The Apple TV box, it's just an overpriced streaming box where you can already do everything that this box offers on your existing TV, right? Wrong. Apple TV has gone from being an Apple hobby project to a fully fledged part of the Apple ecosystem. I actually think it is the best value product that Apple offer, period. But most people are only using about 5% of the capability of what this thing can do. So in this video, I'm going to show you everything that you can do with Apple TV 4K running TV OS 17, by the way, which is still a few weeks from releasing here in the UK as I make this video. I wanted to ensure that this video remained up to date for as long as possible, although most things do also work on earlier versions of TV OS. Stick with me to the end of the video as we have got a lot to cover. Okay, let's get into it. Let's begin with your main method of interacting with Apple TV, the remote. The Siri remote has seen some changes over the years, but essentially you're going to be using one of two main styles. You might have the first gen remote, which is quite small and made of plastic. The top is a touch bar for navigating around the Apple TV interface, and the Siri function can be accessed by pressing and holding the Siri button on the front of the remote. Apple then upgraded the Siri remote to the aluminium version, with the Siri button being moved to the side of the remote and the top being replaced with this new control method. You swipe your finger across the pad to navigate around, and this is known as touch, but you can also use it as a directional pad if you like, clicking on the up, down, left and right buttons. You might find that the touch function is annoying, and if that's the case, you can disable it. Open settings, go to remote and devices, then click pad, and choose from either click and touch to allow for both functions, or click only if you want to turn the touch function off. For all Siri remotes, charging is done by plugging a cable into the bottom, either a lightning cable or a USB-C, depending on the type of remote that you have, and a cable would have come in the box for it. You should honestly only need to do this a few times a year in my experience, unless you're someone who's using the remote for hours and hours every day. Oh, and worth noting is that if you have an iPhone running the latest software, you can go to settings and control center and ensure that Apple TV remote is included in your control center. Then simply open control center while your Apple TV is powered on, select it from the drop down, and you can use your iPhone as a remote for your Apple TV, allowing you to perform literally every function from your phone. So when you power on your Apple TV and set it up, you're going to be greeted by the home screen. Just like the home screen on literally every other Apple device that you might own, you can customize it here on Apple TV. So let's quickly explore everything that you can do. You can group apps together into folders. So this is useful if you want to maybe group your streaming apps in a folder, perhaps your music apps in another, your games in another. Simply press and hold on an app and then choose move to. In here, choose new folder. You can see that Apple TV will attempt to name the folder based on what you put in there, but if you swipe up and tap into the name, you can rename it either using the on-screen keyboard or by dictating it in. To add more apps to this folder, go back to the home screen, tap and hold on another app, choose move, and then choose the folder that you just created from the list. To move an app around the home screen itself, tap and hold on an app, then choose edit home screen. Use your remote to move the app around and tap to place it wherever you want to go. And to delete an app, tap and hold on it, then choose delete app. And if you want to rename or delete a folder, repeat the process on a folder and you'll see that you've got the same options here also. I guess watching content is always going to be one of the fundamental things that every Apple TV owner is going to want to do, so let's explore everything related to that. First up, you're going to need to install some streaming services. Your Apple TV will of course come with some pre-installed, but there are tons out there to choose from, so let me show you how to add one. The easiest way is to use Siri to search for the app. So if I wanted to search for Disney+, Plus, I could activate the search assistant and say Disney+. Plus. If Apple TV doesn't recognize it as an app that you've already got installed, it will prompt you to search for it in the App Store and that will then of course return the result. Just navigate to the app and download it, like you would if this was an app on your iPhone or iPad. You'll then want to log into the app before you do anything else, and if you've got an iPhone connected to the same Wi-Fi network, have that to hand as it really does make the entire process much quicker and easier. To find content to watch, you've got a few options available to you. You could of course browse through an app or use these search tools within an app to find something. But you can also search the wider Apple TV ecosystem using Siri. 
So for example, if I wanted to find Squid Game, I could access the search tool and say Squid Game, and you can see that the result comes up. You've got this open in button, and if you tap on that, you've got the viewing options for whatever you've selected. For this, of course, the only option is Netflix. And if I were to search for Mission Impossible, you can see that there are numerous results, and I can scroll through them all here on the right of the screen. But you don't just have to search by title. Let me show you some other searches that you can perform. Movies directed by Guy Ritchie. Movies starring Margot Robbie. The top movies from 2022. Horror movies from this year. Comedies from the 1980s. Also, let me just take a moment to show you what to do if you spot some content that you want to watch, but not right away. Tap into it and then choose add to up next. This will add the show to your Apple TV watch list so you can always come back to it at a later time. Action movies on Disney Plus. Zombie TV shows. Crime dramas on BBC iPlayer. What should I watch? You can see that there are loads of different searches that you can perform to try and find exactly what you're after. So get creative and see what you can find. The other way that you can find content is to browse the Apple TV app. And I'm gonna cover that in the next chapter. By the way, if you prefer to have content like this in a written format, there's a PDF version of this video complete with screenshots and you can access it along with all other PDFs I've created plus future ones for just $5 a month. You can either scan the QR code that you can see on screen or follow the link in the description of this video to learn more. The Apple TV app is kind of confusing, but once you know what you're looking at, it's actually a really useful app to spend time in. By default, it's gonna be in the upper left of your Apple TV's home screen. You can see that we've got five options at the top of the screen. On the right is the magnifying glass. This is the same search menu that we've seen elsewhere on Apple TV. It's just a different way of accessing it. Then next to that is my library. This is where any movies or TV shows that I've paid to access on iTunes over the years will live. I'll be honest, after building up a collection here years ago, streaming has kind of changed and I don't add to this much anymore, but they're here if I ever wanna watch them. To the right of that is the store, which essentially replaces the old iTunes, and you can choose between movies and TV. In here, you'll find options to rent content or to purchase content. Then next to that is TV Plus. This is Apple's streaming service, essentially their version of Netflix, Prime, Disney Plus, etc. You'll need an active TV Plus subscription to watch anything in here, but there are plenty of offers available giving you quite lengthy free trials. And then to the left of that, you've got Watch Now. This is where all of the content that you've pulled together, regardless of where it lives, will be. It's essentially your watch list, but you can then also get a snapshot of what's available on things like Netflix, Prime, and the other streaming services, as well as on your regional services, so things like BBC iPlayer here in the UK. Tap and hold on a show to either go to that show in the app of choice or to add it to your watch list. Oh, and just to show you, if you've got apps that support live TV, you would simply use Siri to ask it to show you that live channel. So I might say BBC One Live, for example, and that will begin streaming the live feed of the channel, BBC One. So you're watching some content, you now need to know how to control things as you're watching, and there are loads of options. First of all, many of the options that you'd expect to find on the remote are there, like play and pause, and the back button to come out of what you're watching but there's a lot more that you can do if you use Siri. For example, jump to the one hour mark. Play this from the beginning. Fast forward 20 minutes. 
What did he say? This one is especially useful. It rewinds back 10 seconds and puts the subtitles on for a moment. So if you didn't catch what someone said, you can use this to see what you missed. Switch on subtitles. Switch off subtitles. There's a couple of things that you can do using the remote rather than Siri. If you tap up while something is playing, then tap on the speech bubble, you can choose from any available subtitles and closed captions. If you swipe up and tap on the icon to the right of that, you can change the audio track if applicable and reduce loud sounds, which is good if you're watching TV late at night. If you swipe down while TV is playing, you can choose to view the info about that program and the left and right buttons can be used to rewind and fast forward through the content. Also, where applicable, a picture-in-picture -picture option will be available here too. This, I think, covers pretty much everything that you're likely to want to do with playback, but drop me a comment if you know of something else that you can do here. Let's talk about the control center. You access the control center by pressing and holding the TV button on your Siri remote for just a moment. The control center opens in the upper right of your screen, and stylistically, it's very similar to the one on your iPhone or your iPad. Within the control center itself, you have the option to power off your Apple TV. To the right of that, you've got the Wi-Fi network that you're currently connected to, and if you tap on that, you'll be taken to the Wi-Fi page of your settings. Below that, you can toggle Do Not Disturb on or off. This is going to mainly be of use to anyone who has notifications set up to appear on their Apple TV box. I don't, and so I don't tend to use this feature. Beneath that, you've got your audio options. So if you've got HomePods on your network, or Sonos speakers, for example, or your AirPods, you can use this menu to change the output from whatever it currently is to something else. To the right of that, you have a sleep timer where you can choose from two hours, one hour, 30 minutes, or 15 minutes. So if you're someone who likes to fall asleep with the TV playing in the background, you might use this. Beneath that, you can connect a Bluetooth enabled games controller to your Apple TV box. You can buy a dedicated controller or you can use a spare games controller if you have one. The PS4 and PS5 controllers, for example, both work with this. To the right of that, you can access your accessibility functions, which you can amend and set up in settings, which we'll cover in a moment. To the right of that, you can set restrictions, which again, we'll cover separately. If you scroll all the way up to the top of the screen where we accessed Control Center, you can see that to the right, you've got your Apple ID. And this is where you can switch users if you've got multiple profiles set up on this Apple TV box. And then to the left is your home. This mainly seems to show cameras. You can see that I've got one home compatible camera set up in my office and that's visible here and you can click into it to make it a full screen view if you wish. There are some extra Apple apps that are worth a quick mention here because you can get more out of them with Apple TV. Apple Music links to your Apple ID. So if you've got your Apple TV set up to a good sound system, you can use the app here to play your music. Fitness Plus links to your Apple Watch, so you can have workouts showing on your big screen TV and all the information about your vitals will show on the screen while you're working out. Arcade lets you access a range of games to play on your Apple TV, but again, you will need a subscription for this. The Photos app on Apple TV is excellent, letting you not only view your entire photo library in stunning 4K on your TV, but also viewing things like your memories and shared albums. Your Apple TV has a setting section and it can seem a bit daunting if all you're expecting here is a place to change your screen settings. So let's take a quick look through. In general, you can do things like change the name of your Apple TV, choose from amazing screensavers, set it from dark to light mode and set any restrictions, such as only allowing age restricted content via the inputting of a passcode. Obviously great if you've got young kids in the house who know how to use Apple TV. Under users and accounts, you can set the default user and add additional users to this box, meaning you can all have your own profile, your own watch list, etc. Under video and audio, you can set the output for your TV and sound system, choosing from a range of HDR and Dolby Vision outputs for the video. Also at the bottom of this page is color balance under calibration. This is where you can use your iPhone to calibrate your Apple TV by holding the iPhone right up against your TV. Just tap here and follow the steps. Under notifications, you can choose which notifications you'd like to enable or disable. Under AirPlay and HomeKit, you can enable or disable AirPlay as well as conference room display. 
This is where your TV will display the information about the Wi-Fi network it's currently connected to on the screensaver. So if you've got a work Wi-Fi network for guests, perhaps you could use this so that they can see the info that they need to get connected to your Wi-Fi. Remotes and devices is what you'll use to set up your remote, but also to connect game controllers and AirPods under other devices. Accessibility offers a range of accessibility options that you can switch on by default, such as voiceover, zoom, audio descriptions. There's quite a few to choose from here, including options to reduce motion effects like you get on the iPhone. Apps will show you all of the apps that you have installed. Also, it's worth going into some of these to check the location and privacy settings you've enabled for them and change them if you need to. Network will show you your current network setup and you can change it here if you need to. System is where you can perform software updates as well as restart your Apple TV, which is useful if it's behaving a bit weird, or reset it, which puts it back to factory settings. Sleep Now is exactly what it sounds like. It puts your Apple TV into sleep mode. By the way, if you're enjoying the content here, why not consider signing up to my free newsletter, The Proper Weekly, which you can do via the link in the description of this video or by scanning the QR code on screen now. The newsletter goes out each Friday and I include some tech news from the week, a behind the scenes of what's happening here on the channel, as well as a tip for an item in the Apple ecosystem. So long as you're running TV OS 17 or newer, you now have FaceTime on your Apple TV and it uses continuity camera to access the camera on the rear of your iPhone to act as your camera and microphone. Simply open the app, choose yourself from users and find your connected phone. Bring the phone close to the Apple TV box and then find a way of propping your phone up. You can expect a whole host of accessories to be getting released to solve this problem. And that's it, you can then make FaceTime calls using your iPhone on your Apple TV. Center stage will put you in the middle of the screen, portrait will blur out your background, and reactions lets you do things like give a thumbs up or make a love heart to have little animations appear on screen. It works really well, and if you're someone who likes FaceTime, but always wanted to be able to do it from somewhere more comfortable like your sofa in the lounge, you need to give this a go. If you double tap the TV button, so long as you've got click and touch enabled for your remote, you can swipe up to force quit apps here. Honestly, you should only ever need to do this for apps that are freezing or crashing. Don't get into the habit of doing this for all your apps all the time. For the final part of the video, I wanna to talk to anyone who doesn't yet own an Apple TV box. When it comes to choosing your Apple TV, you've got a couple of options. And while it might seem that there aren't any major differences between them, that's not entirely true. All Apple TV boxes that Apple now sells are 4K compatible, so even if you don't own a 4K compatible TV, you're getting that capability in the box, which is good as it means that you're a bit more future-proofed should you ever decide to upgrade your TV. Both current-gen Apple TVs are powered by the A15 Bionic chip, which is the same chip used in the iPhone 13 Pro, by the way, so it's an obscenely powerful computer in a box here with more than enough power to handle everything that you throw at it. Both boxes are Wi-Fi compatible, although only the more expensive box supports gigabit ethernet. So if you plan on hardwiring this to your internet connection, you will have to go for the model that supports that. Beyond that, both boxes are the same, save for the ethernet model also having twice the onboard storage. Honestly, I don't think I've ever come close to using up all the storage that Apple TV offers in the past. My only advice here would be that if you think you might benefit from the ethernet connection in the future, or if you prefer to hold on to the box for as long as possible, spend a bit more and go for the Ethernet model. As of making this video, the price difference, even here in old ripoff Britain, is only £20. So there you go, that's the Apple TV 4K box. As you can hopefully now see, there's a lot to it. And once you know what you're doing with it, it's an immensely powerful streaming box, capable of way more than your average TV. What about you? Do you own an Apple TV? If yes, anything here that I missed out? Drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video.